From kidnapping children to sticking their unelected fingers into secular politics, from their shockingly efficient skills at commanding armies, to their insistence of the inherent malevolence of human emotion, it is clear that the Jedi's regime of suppression and indoctrination actually sometimes cause the galaxy more harm than good. So with that in mind, I'm Gareth from What Culture Star Wars, and here are 10 huge problems no one wants to admit about the Jedi. Number 10, like I just said, they kidnap children. The Jedi have a rather efficient way of expanding their forces, namely scouring the galaxy for force-sensitive children to join their ranks, as you do. In an attempt to reduce any emotional complications that may arise from separation anxiety, the Jedi aim to separate force-sensitive children from their parents at as young an age as possible. Though the exact age range differs from species to species and is never set in stone, it's clear that Anakin, who was nine during The Phantom Menace, was considered too old to join the Order, for example, partially as he was too attached to his mama. Anakin's fear of losing his mother propels him to slaughter an entire village of Tusken Raiders post-training, and his love for Padme seems to be as much a projection of his feelings about his lost mother as it is genuine affection. Given the evidence, the Jedi's decision to separate children from their parents at a young age makes a bit of sense, but that doesn't make it any less inhumane and a bit icky. Number 9. They Repress Natural Emotions if Anakin's turn to the dark side was partially propelled by the emotional consequences of being separated from his mother, it was accelerated by the Jedi Order's insistence that he repress his emotions. Being told that attachment is forbidden, Anakin and Padme conduct their wedding and live out their subsequent marriage in secret, placing a lot of strain and stress on the pair. When Anakin begins experiencing visions of his wife's imminent death, he turns to Yoda for advice. But finding his advice, which basically amounts to let her die and let the Force take its course, mate, insufficient, he goes to the only person he feels he can truly trust, who is Chancellor Palpatine. Having groomed Anakin from a young age, Palpatine jumps on this chance to exploit Anakin's emotions, twisting his arm to the dark side after offering a vague promise that he'll somehow save Padme from death. Though Anakin experienced dissatisfaction with the Jedi Order and democracy throughout the prequels, it was ultimately his inability to talk about his fear of losing Padme with the Jedi that pushed him firmly into the arms of the dark side. Nice one, guys. Just talk about your feelings. Number 8. They Operate Undemocratically Sure, the Jedi exist and operate within the Republic throughout the prequel era, but their apparent respect for democracy is only ever really preached and not exactly practiced. Working closely with senators throughout the Clone Wars, the Jedi represent religious interference within an apparently secular state. Even conspiring to overthrow the Supreme Chancellor Sheev Palpatine despite the overwhelming support of the Senate. Sure, he ended up turning into a mass murderer emperor, but they didn't know he would, did they? In fact, the Jedi's tight involvement with politics actually works against them in the end, as Palpatine uses their growing influence within the Senate to generate a spirit of mistrust against the Order towards the end of the Clone Wars. Indeed, Order 66 is predicated on the idea that every single Jedi is now an enemy of the Republic. And really, that isn't entirely wrong by that point. Number 7. They are no better than the Sith only a Sith deals in absolutes. Obi-Wan Kenobi tells his apprentice Anakin Skywalker as they duel to the death on Mustafar at the end of Revenge of the Sith, completely oblivious to the fact that such a statement is in itself an absolute. In fact, the Jedi are blind to so many of their own misgivings that they inadvertently push Anakin, the most powerful Force user amongst them, to the dark side by forcing him to suppress his emotions and desires. Jedi who question the strict rigidities of the Order are punished in a number of ways, such as being excluded from the Council in Qui-Gon's case, while Ahsoka voluntarily left the Jedi Order after finding out the hard way just how strict they really are. In the original trilogy, the Emperor and Vader were presented as undemocratic tyrants, two mystic demigods who rule the galaxy with an iron fist. But really, is a powerful council of so many democratically unelected members getting tangled up with politics that much better? Number 6. They Monopolize the Force Throughout the first two Star Wars trilogies, there are two types of Force users only, the Jedi and the Sith, the latter title only being revealed in the prequel trilogy. Sure, with Disney's acquisition of the franchise, fans were treated to different types of Force users down the line, such as Rogue One's Chirrut Imwe, a Guardian of the Wills, and the sequel trilogy's Maz Kanata, who knows the Force despite being no Jedi, but for the most part, Force users are aligned to one of two opposing factions. Given the Jedi's tendency to kidnap children who display some sort of force proficiency, it seems they are much more to blame for this duology than their dark side counterparts, the Sith who, after all, only admit two to their ranks at any one time. Apart from a few exceptional cases because they're still bad guys and they do what the hell they want. The Jedi attempt to monopolize the Force, ensuring Force users all follow one unified order, which works toward a vague greater good, rather than allowing Force users the freedom to live carefree in their native planets. 
Number five, they are essentially warlords. Maybe this wasn't the Jedi's original intention, but the monastic order quickly transforms itself into a military force at the end of Attack of the Clones, as Jedi Masters become generals commanding legions of clone soldiers at their disposal. The entire Clone Wars television show portrays the proficiency of the Jedi as soldiers and commanders, each general demonstrating a unique talent for military strategy. After their original appearance as hermit-like guardians of a mysterious force in Star Wars' first three films, the prequel trilogy turned the idea of the Jedi on its head, presenting them in The Phantom Menace as apparent peaceful ambassadors and negotiators, already a far fling from their reclusive existences in A New Hope through Return of the Jedi. But even interplanetary ambassadors are not military leaders. The Jedi's collective ability to turn overnight into a considerable force of military might begs the question. As well as lightsaber duels, are the Jedi trained in questionable military tactics from childhood too? Looks like it. Number four, so many slip from their ranks. Despite young Anakin's twinkle-eyed enthusiasm at the start of The Phantom Menace, the Jedi Temple does not lend itself to a life of luxury. Quite the opposite, actually. A number of Jedi leave the Order due to its strict rules and regulations, sometimes finding a more fitting home for their individual personalities in the dark side of the Sith. The prequel trilogy gives us, of course, Anakin's fall to the dark side, but also mentions in passing that Dooku was once a Jedi, Qui-Gon's former master, no less, who also left the Jedi Order because of um, his political idealism, before joining up with the future tyrannical Emperor of the Galaxy. If two Jedi leaving the Order isn't enough to convince you that the temple must have been something of an inhospitable environment, the Clone Wars television show adds to that number considerably, not to mention much of the other extended canon. Ahsoka Tano, Boris Offee, and Pong Krell are amongst the Jedi who betray or leave behind the Order for various reasons, and to disastrous consequences during the course of the show. Even Asajj Ventress was once a Jedi, and that's still just skimming the surface of those who defected to the dark side. Number three, they are complete personality vacuums. The prequel trilogy was widely slated for its wooden dialogue and its lack of fully fleshed out characters. Compared to the friendly banter that ran through the original trilogy, and was thankfully kind of reignited somewhat during the sequels, a number of prequel trilogy characters seemed rather flat. And this is most obvious in the Jedi Council itself. Kiadi Mundi, Kit Fisto, Plo Koon, and a number of other forgettable Jedi sit around the council muttering a few lines of dialogue between them, each a complete waste of cool and original designs, which seem more oriented towards selling toys than developing their characters further. But it's not just these background characters who are personality vacuums, as even more important Jedi couldn't escape being flattened by George Lucas's pen. Samuel L. Jackson does his best to portray Mace Windu as a badass, but he's not really given much to work with, and even the mighty Yoda from the original trilogy is rendered soulless in episodes 1 through 3. The witty and sarcastic Obi-Wan is better characterized in The Clone Wars than the movies, but even in the prequel films, he has more personality than the rest of the Jedi put together. Don't even get me started on Anakin. While these wooden Jedi are not at all entertaining to watch, this is probably to some extent the point. The prequel trilogy is quite overt about the hubris of the Jedi facilitating Palpatine's rise to power. Lucas takes the opportunity, however, to demonstrate that the Jedi were not only harmful for the galaxy at large, but posed a more intimate threat to its individual members, each of whom lose their individuality as they blend into the collective face of the monastic Jedi Order. Number two, their arrogance meant they made the same mistakes all over again. Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi openly acknowledged the Jedi's role in the rise of Emperor Palpatine, something Skywalker only seemed to realize after unintentionally unleashing a new Darth Vader into the galaxy, his own nephew Kylo Ren. Realizing that the Ancient Order might actually contribute more harm than good, and that it's time for the Jedi to end. Luke flees to exile on Acto after his own Jedi Order falls to his nephew, in much the same way the Order of Old fell at the hands of his father in Revenge of the Sith, keeping it in the family. Acknowledging his own hubris and fear led to Ben's turn to the dark side, and the resulting destruction that followed, Luke attempts to warn Rey about the dangers of a strict Order monopolizing some all-powerful force later down the line. So we'll just have to wait and see if another future trilogy brings with it yet another calamitous revisit of a new Order, under the tutelage of the likes of Rey or some other Force user, once again being inevitably undone by sheer arrogance. And another Skywalker relative, because that's what just happens. Number one, Obi-Wan and Yoda use deceit to influence Luke to kill his father. In A New Hope, Obi-Wan tells Luke that Darth Vader, an old pupil of his, betrayed and murdered his father, Anakin Skywalker. 
Naturally, Luke wanted revenge on the Sith Lord, but in their first battle finds out to his shock in the undisputably most iconic line in cinematic history that Darth Vader was his father after all. Wouldn't you know it? In disbelief, Luke looks to Obi-Wan's Force Ghost for confirmation, only to discover that the old Jedi Master maintains that what he said was true from a certain point of view. No longer believing in the possibility of Vader's redemption, it seems that Obi-Wan and Yoda were grooming Luke to kill Darth Vader, not telling him the Sith Lord's true identity in case Luke's task would be compromised by his sentimentality. Yes, it was more likely down to the fact that George Lucas was making it up as he went, but in canon, it still looks a bit dodgy. Of course, Luke's knowledge that the man behind the mask was his father leads to Vader's redemption, as he sacrifices himself to kill Palpatine once and for all, well, for about 30 years. The Jedi's willingness to deceive Luke in order to twist his arm to kill his own father is proof enough that the Jedi weren't the goody two-shoes of the galaxy they seem to think they were all along. Consider this list ended. Now, do you know of any other huge problems no one wants to admit about the Jedi? Then let us know all about them in the comments section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're there. Also, be sure if you like this kind of thing to head on over to whatculture.com and find some more incredible articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I have been Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. Thank you as always for clicking on this video today, and I'm sure I'll see you very, very soon. May the force be with you. Bye bye.